Open your Bibles to Luke 24, verse 1. I came from a physical therapy for my back session. I just got here in time to do a live program. And I was thinking I was lying on the table there. Refreshing my memory. The two most important points, listen, without these two points that I'm going to present to you tonight, there is no gospel because you don't believe that Jesus died and rose again. I don't even know why you call yourself a Christian. Definitely not a disciple of Jesus Christ. I know Christian has a whole different label to it now depending who's describing what a Christian is. But you're definitely not a disciple of Jesus Christ. I was thinking there, what am I going to do when I come here tonight? I didn't want to get into the last day series because not that I'm not ready to preach on it, it's just you need a little more energy level to make sure I don't miss anything that I want to communicate to you. This has become second nature to me. It's part of my everyday things that I do. That Christ commanded us to do. You don't have to get bread and wine to go to the table of the Lord. He did it at the supper so they could remember because you have to eat. You have to drink. If you want to keep on living in the here and now, unless you're fasting for a day or two, he was using something as simple as eating and drinking. When that happens for you, whether you eat three times a day or five times a day, I want you to stop and remembering me. And most people think that you have to stop because it's built into you, it's drilled into you really, not built, but drilled into you that a plate of food is presented in front of you, you got to stop and pray. Really? We're supposed to be thankful for all things, just not the plate of food because we, wow, it's there in front of us. Am I thankful for substance? Sure. But I don't have to use tradition in a certain way of Practicing that tradition, and most of the time it's the, so everybody else could see me to pray, oh, how holy than thou that I seem to be. But Jesus said, when you pray, go in a closet. It doesn't mean you cannot pray as a group or with someone else, but it's not to become a spectacle, a sideshow. Keep it sincere, keep it real. So you go to the table of the Lord because you choose to do so. I'm telling you, it's not even necessary because Christ used the bread and wine. Something was common in every table at that time. In that time period. And used as an illustration, of course, he made the bread symbolize his body and the wine symbolizing the blood that he would spill. A key thing that you can remember. Remember what? What he was about to do. Go to that cross and die for us when we should have been there ourselves and not him. He had no fault. He had no sin. We should have been the ones going to the cross. All of us. Everyone that's ever been born. He did it for us. And he wants us to remember that. Before we take the elements tonight, I want to review the story because there's two important things here that he wants us to remember. 
Verse 1, Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulchre, bringing up the spices which they had repaired, and certain others with them. Remember, Jesus already died. And they buried him quickly. Three days and three nights went by. Now they're going to go back. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulchre. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. It's gone. Remember, this stone was also guarded by, by, by soldiers. Unless there was some plot going on, somebody paying somebody on the side and making sure all the soldiers got what they needed because if, listen, if Jesus' body was gone, those soldiers would have to pay the price. It was their responsibility to protect it. And it came to pass as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Now you can read this story also in Matthew, Mark, and John. But I chose Luke for a reason. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? Why ye seek the living? Literally, write it down. Him that liveth. Who's the him? Jesus. Wait a minute. We watched him die. He was dead. Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee? Saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified. And the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. And returned from the sepulchre and told all these things of the leaven and to all the rest, the eleven mean disciples and all the other individuals. Disciples also, but not part of the inner group of disciples of eleven, twelve originally, but Judas turned out to be a son of the devil from the beginning. He betrayed Jesus. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary of the mother of James, and other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. And the words seemed to be them as idle tales. They didn't believe it. Because they knew he died. And they believed them not. Then arose Peter, and ran unto the sepulcher, and stooping down he beheld the linen cloths laid by themselves, and departed wondering at himself at that which was come to pass. He still was in doubt. Oh, he has no doubt the body was gone. But did Jesus really rose from the dead? Or these women, grieving so much, have convinced themselves to become delusional of really what happened, where it could have happened. Someone else took them. And I don't want to get into all the reasons why people come up with those kind of silly ideas, but because the point is, I want to stay on track tonight and keep focus. And you read it in Matthew 28, Mark 16, John 20. You read all the gospel records of this particular event. They tell it a little bit differently. It's the same message, though. And it's the first message after those three days and three nights. And that is, I'll go to the board. He is risen. He is risen. That's message number one. That's the first thing that Jesus wanted to be communicated. Here in the story, it says he uses angels to do it. To get that message, he is risen. He is not here. All you're going to find in this tomb is other dead bodies, but he is not here. 
And don't you remember how he told you this prior to even even happening? That he would rise again after being crucified and they remembered his words. Now it's unfortunate. His disciples didn't become instant believers. But put yourself in their, your shoe, their shoes before you start throwing stones. We probably would have been the same way. The same way. Probably caught up in all kinds of things spinning in our mind, trying to rationalize. One reason after another that, no, Jesus is still dead. He's just been taken away and whatever other reasons you want to come up with. But he surely did not rise from the dead. Yes, he did. And I said, when you read these other gospel records, the same stories, Matthew 28, verses 1 through 10, Mark 16, verses 1 through 8. Here in this record, in John 20, I think it's verses 1 through 10, you see all of them telling the same story with all the same message. The first message that Jesus is alive. Him that liveth. Him that liveth. If you don't believe that, don't even participate, participate in the second. The second thing he wanted to emphasize because if you put the gospel records in a timeline when these events happened, the visiting to the tomb, and the disciples coming, and they're all in amazement, what happened? I got to give the woman that went to the tomb, they were believers before the disciples were, that he rose from the dead. But then in the timeline, after that settles down, other disciples besides 11 disciples started departure from Jerusalem and I preached on this before in a timeline the second the next event would be the road to Amamus which you find also in Luke 24 verse 13 and also in Mark in the 16th chapter let's read it and behold two of them went the same day to a village called Amamus which was from Jerusalem Three score furlongs. Three score furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. What things? Everything they experienced the last at least three days and three nights, but they might even got there earlier. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, of course, they're reasoning it. There must be a reason for it. We thought Jesus was going to be our deliverer, our new king in the here and now. I've mentioned this before. You just imagine what they were going, sharing back and forth with each other, trying to rationalize everything that went down and what went wrong. And maybe Jesus was not even what they thought he was going to be. They just put too much hopes in, in Jesus. He didn't step up. God knows what was going through their minds. Like I said, they were disciples, but not in that inner group of disciples. They still were disciples. And they were trying to reason. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself, here Jesus now, appears in the scene. To these two, he drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. Somehow, some way, Jesus was able to pull off. And why not? He just rose from the dead. This would be easy. Putting some kind of blinders on their eyes where they not recognize him. But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. They didn't. They did not know him. I think I have... Something here. Hmm. 
their eyes couldn't make sense of it. The image that they received. So they didn't recognize Jesus. But Jesus said something to them. And he said to them, what manner of communications? I'm sure Jesus knew that he was t- they're talking about him. But he's questioning him. What manner of communications is that you have for one and another? As you walk and are sad. As you walk and are sad. What manner of communications? These that you have one to another. As you walk and are sad. Come on, Jesus. Even though they didn't know who Jesus was. Why did you say who you are right when you walked up to them? Because he's driving a point home so they can remember what they heard in the light but forgot in the dark, in the darkness of what their thoughts drug them into which led to all kinds of doubts, reasons that try to justify what and what was not, try to explain away their hopes, their false hopes, whatever. He was trying to drive a point home. And not just for these disciples, but for everyone, even today. We were not even there 2,000 years ago. So you really think about it. We didn't even get to hear Jesus speak. We just know he spoke and we have what he said. But even the book of John makes the claim. He said so much that libraries couldn't hold it. To paraphrase it. All the information. But when that was all said and done, all they had to remember after this event where he died and rose again is the, what he, what the words that he taught them, that I was going to rise. Don't you remember? And I want you to remember that. From the very first day you realized that, as an actual fact, with all trust and confidence, pisteo, without a doubting mind or thought, from this day forward, and I'm going to show you, remind you, the way I want you to remember it. It's going to be as easy as going and sitting down and having something to eat or drink. Jesus made it quite simple. Man, through all their doctrines, have complicated the issue. And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered, saying unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? Where you been, whoever you are? How can you not know the news? of what happened, Jesus, who said was the Christ. It turns out that he died also. And everything that we believe, now we don't, not sure, we're in doubt. And he said unto them, what things? (laughs) Jesus playing, I almost hate to say it, but how else would you say it? Jesus playing dumb with them. What things? And they said unto him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed. They see, they didn't see him as a savior. A savior that made promises. They saw him as a prophet, mighty indeed. Oh, he could do miracles. And word before God all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted, or hoped, 
that it had been in which he, he which, which should have been redeemed Israel. Besides all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Now, he might have mentioned something about something about three days. But they have come and gone. So we split from Jerusalem. We left because nothing's happening. I only can imagine Jesus' disappointment. That what he so clearly said in the light, they doubted in the dark. Yea, and certain women also our company made us astonished. Literally, in the Greek kind of gives you the sense that they became, or brought themselves to the point that they thought they were out of their mind. What these women were saying to them, the report they were giving, obviously they probably thought they were out of their mind too. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early, which were early at the sepulchre. When they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels which say he was alive. Now they're reducing it down to a vision of angels, not actual angels. They were delusional, I guess, is what they're saying. Which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it, even so as the woman had said, but him they saw not, seeing is believing. All they saw was an empty tomb. They forgot what that empty tomb would mean. And that is, he is risen. He is risen. The first important message after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ that he wanted communicated to his disciples, the inner ones, inner group of disciples of 11 that remained, and plus all the other disciples, both men and women. He wanted the word to go out. He is risen. Now, the response to it, you would think, would be overwhelming. Hallelujah! Lord, where are you? I believe you did rise from the dead. That's not what was received. And a certain of them which were with us went to the sepulchre and found it, even so the woman had said, but... Him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools, O fools. Literally the Greek is, O those lacking intelligence. And slow of heart to believe. There the word is pisteo. To have faith, trust, and confidence in what I, or what you heard, because he didn't reveal himself yet, to be the truth. And not only that, you don't even believe what the prophets told you to expect. Then he said unto them, O ye of lacking intelligence and slow of heart, to have trust and confidence, all that the prophets had spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things, and to enter into his glory? At, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded, literally to explain thoroughly, to explain thoroughly unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village where they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. So these two disciples were about at the, they're, they're at the point of destination. But Jesus, even though they didn't know who Jesus was yet, gave the impression that his journey was not over and he was going to go on. And I've said this before, this was a test. 
that Jesus put these disciples through, do they get turned on again in hearing that what was explained thoroughly to them about what the scriptures had to say concerning Christ? Or, nah, Jesus is dead. That's it. Let's move on with our lives. Let's hope and wish and dream about something else. Someone else may they'll come in, in our lifetime, still in the future. Jesus put them at the crossroads of continuing that doubting stage, or some of the word revived them because it explained thoroughly to them that ah, there is a possibility that Jesus did rise. We're just not seeing it. But this guy is making sense, even though they don't recognize Jesus who he is. So it's just this guy at this time. And what happened? They passed the test in verse 29, but they constrained him, saying, Abide with us. I said that from day one, or closely after day one, in John 15. You have to abide in Christ. Now they want this individual, they did not recognize who he was yet, but they were turned on with the scriptures, just as they were turned on by Jesus, as he profound, profoundly explained to him thoroughly all things. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread, and blessed it, and broke, and gave it to them. He went through the same motions as he did in the Last Supper. And what happened? Remember, he just took the bread. Didn't even have to do anything else. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him. They instantly recognized who he was because Christ reminded them. See, everybody... You see the pictures, the paintings. You think there's only 12 disciples at the Lord's table in that Last Supper. It was a room full, my friend. Probably over the capacity, people coming in and out. Yes, the inner circle, because obviously it communicated the inner circle. We have the record of it in the Gospel record of what was said in that table, at least partially what was said. But there's other there's too that saw what Jesus did before he died. And now he's putting them through the motions again to activate their memory, to remember what they saw and what he said was going to happen. And as soon as they recognized that, guess what? Their eyes were opened. To what? To the first thing on that board. He is risen. They recognized the truth. It hit him, it smacked him right across the face, I guess. And it grabbed their attention. And they knew him. You don't believe Christ is risen from the dead. You don't know him. That's first and foremost. You don't know him. And he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen. The Lord is risen. Indeed, and hath appeared to, and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done the way and, that, and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. He was known of them of breaking of bread. Jesus used that Last Supper moment as an instrument of the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the wine as a teaching moment, as they say now. something that we can do every time, or at least once a day, 
to remember what he did for us on the cross. And what he said what would happen did happen. He did rise from the dead. He is alive and well. And he's also coming back. If he lived up to the first Advent promises, what makes you think he's not going to live up to the second? He's alive and well. He's coming back. Now the second point. The second thing that you want us to remember every time we sit down and gather or you sit down with your family members and gather or you sit by yourself to have some food to drink something for your thirst is to remember acknowledge worship and praise him for what he did that day some 2,000 years ago. Now, in Matthew 26, verse 26, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it. And that's what he was reminding the disciples at, on the road to Amamus. And when they reached the destination point, as they were going to sit and break bread, Jesus took the reins and went through the motions, and immediately their eyes opened. But first, they had to be reminded of what the scripture says. Well, we have it. We have the luxury to read it for ourselves. But I find it amazing how easily it's to forget to do what Jesus commanded us to do, to remember him in this act of eating and drinking what he did for you. Now, you can remember him without eating and drinking. That's more power to you. But we have no excuse once you know all the facts that we have in scriptures of what he given us to as a reminder to say hey don't forget me remember me you're eating food but i give you the bread of life i can handle your spiritual thirst abide in me and as they were eating jesus took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take it, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for missions of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. In my Father's kingdom. Now, Paul, in the Corinthian letter, also instructs in the Lord's Supper. And he says in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 24, I'll start with verse 23. For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. As oft as you drink it. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, ye show, for ye show, literally, ye an announce to yourself, number one, and I like to thank the unseen world that we still remember what Jesus did for us. 
and you have no more power over sin and death. Christ conquered for us in our behalf. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show or ye announce the Lord's death, what he did for us, till he come. Until he come. And to do anything else with this simple commandment of what he wants us to do every time we eat or drink, or as often as you eat or drink, there's no excuse why not to remember what he did. If you're doing it for any other reason, literally it's to take it on word of the lead. I'm not going to get into the verse, verse 27, where it mentions that word of the lead because it's been preached all different ways. And it was abused, even in those early church days, especially by the Corinthians. And of course, all kinds of false doctrines, really, no other way of saying it, have been produced concerning what we simply need to do without complicating it. As a commandment, as a faithful disciple to follow, as often we eat or drink, is to remember Him. Is to remember Him. You don't have to have any special uh, elements. I don't care if you're eating a turkey sandwich or beef stroganoff or drinking wine or water. Those are just symbols of saying, hey, I need to stop and remember what he did for me. It's as simple as that. To declare it anything else besides that is to take the focus off what he wanted us to remember. So the second item on the board, the second most important message is after resurrection, through eating and drinking, a simple thing that you have to do on a daily basis is to remember me, or in this case, remember Christ. One, I have risen. I want you to remember that, Christ speaking. And two, remember me, what I did you, did for you, so you one day could also rise from the dead with a new body, just as I did. Even though your spirit will go on and catch up with that new body someday, or even in our time, the possibility of having our bodies transform in a twinkling of an eye. In either case, remember what I've done to put you in a position to have that benefit, that blessing, that promise. Remember me. One, the first message that he wanted to go out after his resurrection, I'm alive and well. I have risen. I have been lifted up. Now remember the second message, the reason why I went through this in the first place. It was for you, for me. Well, Christ not speaking for himself, but for our, for our case, for myself and for you. I went through all that for your benefit. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son to rescue us. I sat there, I laid there today in the physical therapy table and says, it's unfortunate. It's not taught simply because it's not a complicated message. The first two messages, the most important messages in the gospel record that Jesus is alive and well, he did rise from the dead, and he wants us, number two, to remember him. 
And like I said, you put in a timeline. After the resurrection, everybody's wondering what, the, what, what, went, what went on. They're saying they see him. Well, they didn't see him, but they got messages from the angels, which they reduced down to they're having a vision. They cleaned it up a little bit. In other words, they're having delusional, even the nightmares of what they think they saw. But it's not really the truth because we know he, he, there's no body to be found. Somebody must have took them or moved them to a different location. Whatever happened, they're delusional. They're believing something because they want to believe it because they're so sad and in grief that they can't believe anything else. But Jesus straightened that out quickly, didn't he? After he got the message out that he rose from the dead through his angels, he quickly showed up in person himself and say, and reminded them. He didn't just come out to these two disciples and say, here I am, just like I told you, like I taught you, even though you doubted, here I am. No. He expounded in the scriptures to remind them what he already taught them, bring them back to a remembrance stage in their mindset, and the final act was when he saw him broke that bread. Aha! That was Christ himself. And they made a beeline back to Jerusalem to tell the others. By the time they got there, because the timeline is really close, it, Peter already knew, and maybe some of the others. But that's all he wants us to do when we go to the table of the Lord, is remember him. Don't come with any other condition. This is about him and what he's done for us. You can communicate everything else at some other time, but this is to remember him, that he broke his body and he spilled his blood for us. He fulfilled what was prophesied in that first advent. And I'm remembering him tonight, that I have trust and confidence that he did rise from the dead. And I understand that he wants me to remember what he did for me. And you should remember what he did for you to rescue from your spiritual diseased life to give you a new hope, an eternal hope, not just based on the here and now, but for eternity, to be with him, to rule and reign with him, and everything else he has in store, and I'm sure he has a lot, because there's a lot of eternal rewards. But first, we cannot forget in the here and now that he is alive. He did rise from the dead, and we ought to remember what he did for us on that cross, on that starus. Take the bread and take whatever element you have. I happen to have, I think it's some wine here and partake tonight, remembering what he did on that cross, and he is alive and well, just as he promised. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for allowing your only begotten Son to do what he did. The world didn't want Jesus, but the world needed him, needed him badly, and he gave his life for us. Remember that tonight as you take the bread and as you take the wine. Thank you, Jesus. Play a song. I want to hear from you.